welcome to Aston Means Business, a podcast from Aston Business School. My name's Steve Dyson. I'm a journalist who's interviewing some of the UK's top business academics here at Aston. This podcast has been going since October 2019, and there are now more than 45 previous episodes that you can find and listen to by simply Googling Aston Means Business. Today's episode is subtitled Researchers Focus on Developing Healthier Workplaces. We're going to look at the Healthy Work Research Unit at Aston University, where a team of multidisciplinary researchers have developed a united focus on offering insights and recommendations for improving health at work. We're going to explore this subject with Dr. Simon McCabe. He's a senior lecturer in behavioural science at Aston Business School and is also head of the Healthy Work Research Unit. Hello to you, Simon. Hi, Steve. Thanks for having me. Simon, let's start by asking about who you are. What were you doing before you came to Aston Business School and what are you doing now here at Aston? Yeah, so previously I was at the University of Stirling up in Scotland and uh, there I was a lecturer in behavioural science and I helped to direct the Behavioural Science Centre. So uh, for those who are unfamiliar, behavioural science is kind of the synthesis of economics and psychology. And I suppose that one of its defining features is that it is focused on applied work. So trying to take what we learn in the lab and actually get it out the door into the wild to make a difference in the real world. And so there was a position advertised at Aston. And as part of that, they mentioned this healthy work research unit and they needed a a leadership figure there. And so given my experience, as in part of the direct, directorial team of the Behavioural Science Centre, it was a good fit. Simon, um, the Healthy Work Research Unit, what it exists for, is pretty obvious through its name, but can you tell us a bit more detail about the different things it does and what its out- ideal outcomes are? Yeah, so increasingly there's been an awareness and a focus on well-being, and that's um, kind of bled over into the employment and business and management world as well. And it's an interesting area because we've currently and uh, on the horizon of going to be facing a bunch of different challenges. So we've had COVID, for example, there's the cost of living crisis, strikes in various sectors. There's talk about the four day working week where we have an increasingly aging workforce. And one of the other hot topics, I suppose, at the moment is the role of artificial intelligence and technology in the workplace. And so While people may think that kind of well-being has been done to death in some ways, we are kind of at a new frontier with it. And trying to understand how it operates in the workplace is very important for obvious reasons. Um, But one of the other things that we want to do, which perhaps isn't so obvious, is that when people think about well-being in the workplace, it's are you providing mental health resources? Um, Are you providing appropriate work-life balance, etc.? Uh, What we want to do is instead take a broader view of that and and talk about and think about what's called the the well-being ecosystem. So what do the things around work that also feed in to employment have to do with well-being? How do they impact it? So things like uh, commuting into work. uh, Is my work meaningful? Does my organization act in a way that aligns with my moral beliefs? So taking kind of much wider view than people might may think of when they think about well-being in the workplace. Before we delve into the detail of some of the current projects at the Healthy Work Research Unit, Simon, and perhaps you can share with us some of your own previous work in this area, people you've worked with and what you've helped them to achieve or develop or improve. Yes, so as I mentioned, uh, as part of the the leadership team of the Behavioural Science Centre, we did have an applied focus and it was about shifting things away from just simply publishing and doing studies that appear in journals and actually trying to to make an impact in the real world. So uh, my own personal interest is in what's called threat processing. So how is it that people, when they experience a variety of threats, respond? So those threats could be things like social exclusion, health threats, uh, mortality, environmental threats. Um, And so we worked with a bunch of different partners, including uh, the World Health Organization, for example, to collaborate with them to figure out how we can reduce people uh, from taking antibiotics when they're not supposed to. 
Um, we have looked and worked with Zero Waste Scotland and uh, different council regions throughout Scotland trying to understand how people respond to reminders of environmental degradation and what that does to uh, recycling and green behaviours and things like that. But perhaps more relevant to what I'm doing as part of the Healthy Work Research Unit, uh, we also looked at how the mere idea of becoming unemployed can lead people to experience existential concerns. So existential concerns are things like to do with mortality. And so we know that there's a bunch of uh, unpleasant and negative effects of becoming unemployed. And what drove this work to back up just for a minute is at the time, we were interested in the idea of precarious employment and zero hour contracts. Um, And so how is it that when people have work and then lose it, what does that do to them psychologically? And so we ran an experiment where we had people who were employed have a task where they consider a day where they they lose their job or a day where they have something unpleasant happen, but it's not as bad as losing your job. Uh, So in this case, it was just what would a day with dental pain feel like? And those people who uh, had been led to imagine what life would be like if they had lost their job, um, they reported far more existential concerns. So they they, uh, to get into the technicalities of it, Um, they reported what's called greater death or accessibility. So the idea of mortality was more readily available to them. And to kind of get into the conceptual stuff here, the idea is that employment provides benefits beyond simple pay. So it provides us with um, social connections, with goals to strive for, with structure. And so losing your job isn't just, well, I don't have a paycheck anymore. It's that you've lost a lot of the defenses that provide meaning to your life. And when those defenses are gone, these existential threats can loom larger for the individual. Simon, coming back to the Healthy Work Research Unit, tell us more about the main projects. I understand uh, one, a little bit linked to what you've just been talking about, um, is is about working in dangerous places. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the research unit is currently made up of about 10 members and we all have different skill sets. Um, So one of our members, uh, Dr. Karen Mayer, has been working with Uh, external partners who are involved in the production of uh, batteries, lithium batteries for um, electric cars and and different things like that. One of the nuances of that kind of work is that because of the the product, it has to be produced and worked on in what's known as an ultra low humidity environment. So any moisture in the atmosphere could damage the product. Um, and in the UK at the minute, there's about 200 employees that work at the, in, in these factories, but the UK government has invested heavily in the area and it's expected to grow up to 2,000 over the coming years. However, little is really known about the health and well-being effects of this environment. So because it's an ultra-low humidity environment, it actively sucks kind of moisture out of the people that work there. And so risk of de- dehydration and, and other physical um, woes can kind of emerge, but it's, it's been really kind of understudied and it, it's, it's poorly understood. So Karen's working with colleagues at Coventry University to understand the physical symptoms that can emerge from working in these environments, but also, again, to think about the applied angle is what can we do to encourage people who work in those environments to consume more water? So they're kind of told, you know, you should be on your break having a glass of water but the reality is that many people don't follow through on that or you know they read it once and then they forget about it so how is it that we can intervene whether it's you know changing where the uh, the water coolers are located do we need to introduce signage does there need to be special training sessions to get people to become aware of the threats associated with this environment because it is a hidden threat. It's a, you know, Karen likes to refer to it as potentially being the, the, the next asbestos. Um, it's something that people don't often think about or, or know how to deal with. Um, and so how is it that we can make empirically based practical recommendations so that people take appropriate precautions and act in a way that is going to keep their well-being and their health in good shape? Well, that's really interesting to hear because that's quite a, a practical, um, physical project almost. And it shows the diversity of the research you've got at the unit. I, I understand that one of the projects that you're looking at is more psychological in terms of how experiences of mortality um, impacts NHS workers and the way that they um, have um, perhaps not as healthy uh, as an experience in the workplace as they would like. Absolutely. So... 
within the NHS, particularly at the, the level of kind of the nurses and the midwives, there's an issue of, of burnout, of presenteeism and a host of other um, psychological problems. And one of the things that um, some data recently revealed is that these these folks aren't taking um, their annual leave like they should. So that they're entitled to a certain number of days and many of them aren't taking it. Many of them um, fail to be able to take their, their break and many of them stay on after their shift is, is set to end. And so why is it that they do that? And kind of the obvious or the traditional answers would be that there's simply a staff shortage and these people feel obligated to stay on and, and do more work than they perhaps should or to work when they're ill. Um, my work has focused on responses to threats and uh, kind of similar to the unemployment stuff. Um, if you are faced with a mortality reminder or, or a threat, one way to cope with that is to try and get a sense that the world is meaningful and that what you're doing is of value. And many of these uh, nurses and midwives employed will, will feel that their job is important and that's where they get this sense of value and that, yes, I am a person that has a skill set and something to offer and I'm a person of worth. So perhaps counterintuitively, they're responding to these mortality reminders and throwing themselves into their work when perhaps they don't need to and certainly aren't obliged to based on their, their contract. Um, and so while that may seem good, that great, we've got workers more willing to, to stay on and do duties that they aren't necessarily um, having to do, there are obviously downstream consequences for not only uh, the nurses, mental health in that they're working when they shouldn't be, but also patient health. So these are likely to be exhausted. Maybe they're not operating at 100 percent. And so that's when you can get uh, medical errors occurring. And, and your research in that area, Simon, what's your methodology and, and what outcomes are you hoping um, will inform you in terms of your recommendations? Yeah, so this work is experimental in nature. So, uh, so given that the hypothesis, if you like, is that when people are reminded of mortality, they will throw themselves into uh, endeavours that will give them a sense of value and meaning and that they're, they're a person of worth. So the first thing that we do is we recruit nurses and we do that online through uh, an online participant pool uh, and then they're exposed to one of two different tasks and the, the first task is uh, they're reminded of mortality so they write about what they think their own death will be like and then in the other task it's again about something negative but not necessarily mortality so it could be again dental pain for example uh, and then what we do is we uh, have measured um, the extent to which these employees gain a sense of self-esteem from their job. So we simply ask them on a scale from one to 10, um, how important is your job to your sense of self-worth? And so people can be very high on that and some people can, can be lower. And so the idea is, or the prediction is that those people who derive a sense of value and self-esteem from their job, when they're reminded of mortality, then they're going to likely turn to that as a defense mechanism, as a way to cope with this uh, unpleasant reminder of mortality. Um, and one of the ways that that might manifest is through working overtime or working when they don't have to. And so we've got a bunch of measures um, that look at a fictional scenario where they have, for example, a holiday planned in a couple of weeks time with family but they've been asked by their manager if they would be willing to take on some additional shifts in two weeks time. And so this is where we're pitting kind of that work-life balance against each other. And the idea is those that get a sense of value from their job after mortality reminders would be more willing to give up the holiday to take on those additional shifts. So that's one of the measures we have. Another is we simply present them with a calendar, a blank calendar, and they have to indicate out of these 28 or 30 days or whatever, how many of them would you be willing to work? And again, the idea is those that get a sense of value from their job after mortality reminders, they're going to have that calendar full of X's, right? They're the ones that are going to be like, yeah, I'll work uh, all, all days of the month, which is, of course, an unhealthy habit to get into. The way that we recruit uh, NHS workers is through an online participant pool, which is called Prolific Academic. And that has the option to include what are called screener questions. So we can get an idea of where people are working in, in what sector. And so there's an option there for, for healthcare workers. I'm impressed with the range of work that you're doing at the unit, Simon, because it doesn't just involve people who are actually in work. Um, I know there's been lots of recent discussions about getting people in their 50s and above back into work. 
And one of your other projects at the Healthy Work Research Unit is looking at how people can be attracted to do this. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so as you mentioned, um, there's been lots of chat uh, at the government level about what has sometimes been referred to as the Great Resignation. So uh, lots of people 50 and above when COVID hit decided, you know what, I've, uh, I'm out, I can take my early retirement and I don't particularly uh, want to take the risk of going into work physically. You know, I'm an elder and potentially vulnerable. vulnerable. But also those people uh, tended to be relatively uh, well off financially, so it wasn't too much of a financial risk for them to leave the workforce early. What we wanted to do then was think about the options on the table for the government. So they've been playing around with um, when people are entitled to their state pension and, and things like that. What we wanted to do was focus more on how can we use the ways that we recruit people and use our insights from psychology to perhaps make job postings more attractive to uh, those uh, more senior. Uh, and so these, remember, are the folks who are, tend to be highly skilled and in leadership positions as well. So it's really important that we can, if they're willing, to bring them back into the workforce, but for the, for the right reasons. And so traditionally, the you know standard economic model of incentives would say, we'll just pay them more money. And so in the job postings, you might think the way to try and attract um, people back into the workforce is just say, like, here's the salary and focus on kind of the material uh, benefits. However, there's research from the world of psychology that suggests that as people age, they become less focused on material things and more focused on what's called generativity, which is the uh, interest in passing on uh, values and skill sets and training and knowledge to future generations. Um, and so maybe highlighting that or making that more salient, the potential to work as part of a team to develop something. Um, so more highlighting that the downstream long-term benefits to future generations may make those job postings more appealing. So it's very much at the design phase. So we are uh, we're currently looking at three different job postings and altering the text essentially that goes into those job postings and the layer of them. So as I mentioned in the first condition, um, it would be focusing on here's the salary, here's the benefits, here's how much time you need to be in the office. And then in the second one, it would be focusing more on the opportunity to work as part of a team. Uh, and then we also have a, a member of our research unit who is focused on coaching. And he's saying that it might be worth having a third job posting where kind of the opportunities for self-development are made more salient. So very early days, but I think a, a relevant project given, like I said, this massive gap in the labour force at the minute. Now, Simon, as well as this episode of Aston Means Business, I understand that the Healthy Work Research Unit uh, is shortly launching its own podcast series. Tell us more about that. Yep, so we are hopefully launching uh, what is going to be titled the Healthy Work and Workplaces podcast at Aston. Um, so far, we have got one recording in the bag with a PhD candidate, um, Laura Byrne. She's doing some really fascinating work on well-being and well-being strategy. Um, so we, we have uh, interviewed her and recorded that. And she's got some interesting stuff to talk about. Again, given the burgeoning interest in well-being and lots of different companies coming up with explicit well-being policies, um, her understanding and her data show that, that that is great in principle, but what is really important and maybe where there's a gap or work to be done is how that policy is translated to the folks on the ground doing the work. And so what she did was a series of interviews with kind of ground level employees and managers and senior management. And she found that while managers and, and senior management had a good understanding of this well-being policy, the folks lower down the ladder didn't really understand what it was about. Either they didn't know that it existed um, or there, were, that there was muddled mes messages perhaps between what management was saying and what they, they understood. So while it's certainly an advance and a positive thing that companies are thinking more and coming up with explicit well-being policies, there's work to be done on how that trickles down and how it's experienced. If you're interested in keeping up with the Healthy Work Research Unit, we have the podcast and that's hoping to launch a new episode once every month. Uh, we also have our Twitter feed, which is healthy underscore work underscore AU. So you can follow us there and we advertise when we have um, events going on or new publications and all that good stuff.
Dr. Simon McCabe, Senior Lecturer in Behavioural Science at Aston Business School and Head of the Healthy Work Research Unit. Many thanks for taking part in this episode of Aston Means Business. Thanks for having me, Steve. And thanks to you, our audience, for listening to Aston Means Business, an original podcast series for Aston University. Remember, if you enjoyed today's episode, you can find and listen to earlier episodes by simply Googling Aston Means Business. And if you're interested in anything else to do with business and management, why not check out what Aston Business School has to offer at www.aston.ac.uk forward slash courses. We've also got a podcast series called Society Matters, which interviews top academics at Aston School of Social Science and Humanities about current issues and concepts which shape our world and the way that people live. You can find those episodes simply by Googling Society Matters Aston. Meanwhile, we'll be back soon with more interviews with some of the UK's top business academics here at Aston Business School. Aston means business. Thanks for listening.